Good morning, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the What's Up webcast here at Skywatcher. This takes place every Friday, 10 a.m. to 11 a.m. Pacific time. And today we're gathered with one of our special friends. His name is Trevor Jones of Astro Backyard. You've probably seen him in his many, many YouTube videos about amateur astronomy and astrophotography. I know I've spent way too much time on his channel. Um, and so have 127,000 other people. But today we have him joining us today and we're excited to have him on here. So uh, let me bring our buddy in here. Hey, Trevor, how are you this morning? I'm good, Kevin. How are you, buddy? Oh, it's another lovely day here in the desert. How's it up in Canada? It's cold and uh, there's no snow. It's actually turned to rain now, so it's above freezing. Uh, but yeah, not not exactly sunny and beautiful like it is for you right now. Ah, uh, well, it's spring, so hopefully it'll clear up up there and you can get back to what you do best. Um, so today we're just going to be talking casual astronomy and see kind of where it goes from there. And for those of you who I'm sure are going to have many a question for Trevor, we're going to wait till probably the last 20 minutes to open up a Q&A for that. So hold your questions till then, and then that way we can uh, make sure Trevor gets the questions field over to him. So uh, I know I've talked to you a lot, Trevor, about astronomy, but I've always been curious. Um, how have you, how did you actually get started in astronomy? I know a lot of us have, we all have our story of, oh, my mom got me a telescope and what have you. But uh, what's your story on how this uh snowball effect has started so it started later than i think it did for a lot of people so i was about i think i was 25 25 26 years old before i got into astronomy uh so you know most of the stories i see it's about you know i got my first telescope as a kid and my my parents got me into it and stuff but it was way later for me and uh, it's something I still it bothers me that I don't know the exact trigger that made me want to do it. But I decided to get a telescope at that age and I ended up getting the biggest telescope I could afford at the time, which was a four and a half inch Dob, which is a really small mirror uh, for a Dobsonian telescope. Um, and then so that was my first visual telescope. And that was the, the scope that I saw. Saturn for the first time and Jupiter and the moon and just the that summer feels magical of 2010 when I explored the night sky and uh, basically it started with just uh, an interest to see these objects in real time for myself and then it led down the rabbit hole of astronomy in general and learning more about what I was seeing and then that eventually led to photography, putting the camera up to the eyepiece and, you know, the rest is history. But yeah, it was that first Dobsonian telescope when I was about 25 years old that started the whole thing. Um, I know we all have some story. I got my first telescope when I was like nine from my mom. It was a little 50 millimeter refractor. So the fact that you started out with a four and a half is like, whoa. So, <laughs> yeah. and even nowadays, everyone's so lucky because... Um, you have all these Dobsonians and stuff like that that you can get for like a couple hundred bucks now. So I have beginners that are like, oh, I'm, my first telescope is an eight inch. It's like, man, if I had an eight inch when I started, that would have been awesome. <laughs> so yeah. people definitely have it. I think there's so many options nowadays to get started with stuff that people definitely luck out compared to, you know, even in 2010 um, when you got your scope. Uh, you know, four and a half inch is still a popular scope, but now you can get like a six and eight or a 10 for not a whole lot more. So it's pretty awesome to be involved with it. Um, did you have an interest in astronomy when you were younger, like just a generic thing or it didn't really hit? From I there? mean, I thought it was cool. I'd be like, oh, you know, it's a, there's a full moon tonight, just very mild. And honestly, I was, uh, as a kid, I was so much more into the arts, music, and uh, you know visual art than I was science so it's really sad to say I mean if I could go back and do it again I would I would have paid way more attention in science class but I was so focused on you know other things at that time um, science and astronomy came much later that's cool yeah it, it's just it's fun to see everybody get into it and everyone's got their own story on how we all get involved with this and 
you know, I know sometimes when we get really involved with it, you know, both of us do this professionally now that you you almost forget your root at that point because you've been doing it for so long. You, I don't want to say you get jaded to it, but you get jaded to it because it's <laughs> now you're now you're focused on you know bigger and more advanced things especially now that you're doing imaging and you know it seems the days where you know just seeing a little glimpse of the rings of saturn through a tiny telescope was like oh my god and now it's like oh man i lost a five minute sub to a satellite it's like first world problem right there totally yeah i think it, it is important to keep that perspective if you can uh, keep it in mind because you got you know it's always valuable to remember why you do something. Uh, it kind of brings you back down to earth. And uh, yeah, I guess there's there's definitely some emotions that were drawn up those that first summer looking through that Dobsonian telescope. That that excitement uh, I can still kind of tap into that now. And uh, I think that's that's helpful for beginners to see because as you said, you can. Go, you get so far advanced that you almost forget the the early stages and the fun uh, involved at those stages. Um, where did you, you know, obviously astrophotography is the real focus of Astro Backyard now, but where, when did the transition begin to happen from, okay, this is really cool to I'm going to slap a camera on this thing and start going for the, the top shelf stuff? So it was, uh, I had at the time when I was doing all that visual observing, I had a point and shoot camera, a little Canon uh, power shot, uh, you know, a kind of a camera that most people had at that time. Uh, I'm dating myself, but camera phones weren't super popular back in 2010. So um, at that time, that was the camera I had access to. So I tried it putting it up to the eyepiece of my, my telescope, the 25 millimeter eyepiece. And uh, I could actually take pictures of the moon and Mars and Saturn, and they, they were terrible pictures. But that's when I was like, oh, my goodness, I really like being able to, to show people what I saw uh, through this picture. And people, even at that time, these shaky pictures of Saturn, I would, you know, bring it to a party, bring my little camera in my pocket to a party, but like, I have pictures of Saturn with me. And they're like, no, that's not possible. I'm like, yeah, I took this through my telescope. So those were the, the early stages. And then the whole deep sky astrophotography thing that was, man, and I'm sure we all have a story here, but like just the, the overwhelmingly daunting learning curve involved with, okay, so I need a DSLR camera and I need to attach it with these adapters and I need every, all the pieces need to fall into place before you can get to that level. So that was a slow and, uh, you know, it wasn't a painful process, but it was a slow one and humbling. Yeah, I... I think that's something that a lot of people should, um, you know, like equipment nowadays, there's so many options and, you know, working at Skywatcher, we kind of fan the flames of that a little bit, but, um, you know, there's, especially with astrophotography, you've got all different methods and cameras and styles of astrophotography that you can do. Um, I think it's important for people to know that something as simple as just going out and taking a picture of the moon and getting started that way is a good way to plant the seed and then at that point you just slowly advance with that because i think it's really easy to kind of snowball into it too fast and then you kind of you get it gets confusing because there's too many things being put into it so i i'm and then i know that's what you did was you know just starting something basic is a great way to get started because at least you become acquainted with this is my telescope. There are many like them, but this one is mine. Um, mm -hmm. So um, it seems like you've gone on to the same route there. And I know you get a million and a half questions a day about how do I, uh, how do I get started and what's a good way to get started? Yeah. And uh, it, it is important to have realistic expectations early on where little minuscule victories are exciting to you where you don't actually look at a pod images or some of the amazing i mean astrobin if you look at the gallery on astrobin those are like professional quality images being taken by amateurs and they're so good and if you if your expectations aren't set properly you might you know wonder why 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 don't my images look like this but the amount of work and time 
uh, and equipment that has gone into those shots. You need to, you know, you just need to pace yourself and improve on your last image too. Don't don't compare it to others, at least early on. I think there's something to be said to, to see a great image and be inspired and work towards it. Uh, but if it's just making you feel defeated in the fact that your your images just can't don't match this level, that's a dangerous thing too. So, um, yeah, it's that that's a challenging part of the hobby. I think is is you know managing your expectations and not getting too down uh, about the quality of them and just being you know staying positive and being excited about the little improvements you're making. Yeah, I I think those are really good points. You know, as, as people who probably talk to a lot of people getting started in uh, particularly astrophotography is it it can get discouraging because there is so much really good stuff out there but I, like you said it's a matter of perspective because there's so much that you could compare yourself to um like you have amazing imagers um and then you have beginners it's like i'm oh i have to spend 20 or thirty thousand dollars to get an amazing image or more and that's not really the case but you also should remember that when you're looking at some of these people from you know a pod or aic uh teams is they've been doing this for a long time um so and now it's even it's never been easier to start getting good images now but it's still a matter of the biggest thing i think people need to remember when getting started in this is it's gonna take time and it you know it's kind of like a fine wine where it, it generally will get better with age and your skills will sharpen and your eye will sharpen and i know you do uh photography on the other side like birding and stuff and i'm sure that carries many of the same traits as astrophotography and it and you're a musician and i'm sure a lot of other people including myself you know you don't just pick up the guitar you know do the drums and you slam out you know some you know crazy time signature at that point it's like it, it's gonna take time for you to get it and it's okay if you screw up it's okay it's just digital so we're not doing film anymore so that's right it, and it's fun. i just wanted to make the point that uh also, when you see these amazing images on, you know, an APOD image or Astrobin, man, they, they earned it. They worked hard to get there. They, you can't just say, oh, well, of course they take amazing pictures because they have all this amazing gear. That's not the way it works. You have, because there's a little thing called image processing. So even if they do have this amazing gear, they really had to know what they were doing in the image processing side of things. And when you do have that sharp eye, as you said, I love that. Um, then you know, then you can appreciate the subtle things they did in the processing and why it's such a brilliant image because it's like, oh, you can capture data, but if you don't know how to process it, you're only halfway there. So I, uh, I never look at these amazing images and say like, oh, must be nice. Like, no, there, there's a lot of hard work that goes behind these images. Like no other form of photography is there the amount of, you know, grunt man hours behind them. Yeah. And that's, um. I've only you've been doing I think you've been doing imaging longer than that several years more than I have I'm still pretty new at this but it's it's a learning curve and it's I you get a lot of people who come in and they're especially from like the nightscape world now with the star adventure and stuff is you get a lot of people who are like well I'm a professional photographer and I it's not something we try to discourage people on but just because you're a professional in one aspect and discipline of photography doesn't mean you can walk in here and suddenly it's going to be like, boom, a pod done, uh, mic drop and you're out of here. Um, <laughs> it, yeah, it's, it's really kind of, we tell people a lot of times that the only, uh, things between photography and astrophotography that relate is a camera and that's where it stops. So it's, it does take some time to do it. So, you know, but it's good that the, the sooner people understand that astronomy is literally the study of time, it, I think it, when you finally, and I, I know you doing this and now I understand too, when you do get that shot, finally that comes up after all the work and everything, it's, you know, it's kind of like I earn my stripes now and it's, you you feel like you've accomplished all that after all that work. Absolutely. Yeah. When you hear the professional photographers starting astrophotography for the first time and they say, man, this is the hardest thing I've ever done. Like you really realize it's like, wow, it is actually pretty difficult 
when you're, you know, when you're on the outside looking in at the beginning, it, it seems nearly impossible. So, uh, but it's easy to forget that when you've been doing it successfully for a few years. But uh, yeah, it's a pretty special hobby, that's for sure. Um, so now that you've kind of explained where you got started and how you you dove into the dark arts of astrophotography, um, what, uh, where did the idea of astro backyard and youtube become a thing because that you know astrophotography is hard enough as it is and now it's like i'm going to record myself at the same time so um because you're one of the largest if not the largest um astronomy channel on youtube with 127,000 subscribers at this point um so when did astro backyard kind of pop up in your head so it's it's kind of cool, uh, kind of fairy taleish, the fact that uh, so in 2015, Ashley and I moved into our first house, and so 2015, as if you were paying attention, five years after I discovered astronomy, we finally had, uh, you know, a, I finally would have my a backyard of my own to do imaging in, and uh, before then we were living in an apartment. Uh, with no balcony. So if I wanted to do astronomy, I literally had to, you know, walk to the park across the street in the dark by myself, which is not ideal, or go to, at the time, my astronomy club's observatory. And that was, man, those were the formative years there. Um, but I didn't have a place where I could regularly enjoy this hobby that I love so much. So the idea of having an astro backyard of my own was so exciting to me. Uh, that before we moved in, so I, the first thing I created that was named Astro Backyard was, believe it or not, the Twitter account. And uh, at Astro Backyard was available because I just thought it had a nice ring to it. Um, and then I ended up getting, uh, you know, the, the Facebook page and all the social media stuff, Instagram. I'm like, cool, Astro Backyard, kind of a cool name. And then later that year, um, in December, I registered AstroBackyard.com. And I was like, oh, that has a nice ring to it. Um, I can have a website, a place to share my images, uh, kind of blog about my experiences because I think people will, you know, get something out of this and I can kind of journal my stories of astronomy in the backyard. And I know there's a lot of people doing that now and there's, there's something to be said about it. It's like, it's almost even more fun going through this process. If you get to share it along the way, you feel like you're, you're not alone because you have people weighing in like, oh yeah, I remember going through that. And so that's how the, the Astro Backyard aspect of it started. And then the YouTube channel would, you know, to, to name it Astro Backyard was, was made sense. But I re it was more of an experiment. I'm like, well, what if I just recorded a video about some of the stuff that I talk about on this, you know, blog website? And I wonder if, you know, people will actually watch it or I wonder if I'm good on camera or if I, I didn't even know how to edit videos. So, you know, I kept doing it. People were watching. People were saying nice comments and saying, oh, this is great. Do more. So I was like, OK, I guess I guess I will. And then the YouTube channel became so much larger than the website itself that it became now it's, you know, how most people, if they've heard of Astro Backyard, they just think of the YouTube channel. So it all happened very slowly and very is very experimental. But, um, you know, the way things came together, it the whole way along, it felt like yeah, no, this is, I think this is a good thing. I think I'm going to keep doing this. And here we are. Um, I know you've, uh, you've sent a couple other people our way, at least that have done their own YouTube channels. But if there's someone who's watching that was curious or wanted to start their own YouTube channel, um, I've looked into doing it before and obviously we're doing it here, but it's a tremendous amount of work on the back end because what you see is very polished. Um, what would you uh, tell someone who was thinking about, you know, regardless of the topic, but what they would do for that? So uh, you definitely start slow and don't like the, the stuff, like the, the polished look and the, you know, getting the better audio and the lighting and all that stuff where you see these really clean videos. Don't worry about that early on because that will just create hurdles and excuses not to do it. Um, so, I mean, when I, the, my first few videos looked like they were shot on a potato and the audio was even worse. Uh, I, I cringe looking back to some of my videos from like two, three years ago and the audio, it's like, oh, I can't believe I didn't even realize how bad it was. But 
I just go at it naturally, use your phone and just record, just get comfortable with talking to a camera and the editing process. Because yeah, like you said, there's a lot of work on the back end. I don't think people realize that when I put out a video, say once per week, there's 20 to sometimes 30 hours of editing putting in, put into that video. So that kind of stuff, I wouldn't expect the average person to do, nor could they justify that kind of time on, on this little side project. Um, but start slow, just practice um, recording yourself and talking to the camera and getting more comfortable because when you do get comfortable on camera, then you can start just recording everything that happens and that natural emotion will come through. And that's what people love about YouTube is that it's real, right? Something overly polished and fake, you can just watch that on a reality TV show. They want the realness. So some of these successful YouTube, up and coming YouTube channels, astronomy based YouTube channels, they've, they've mastered that. They have the realness of it, the, the sharing uh, when they mess things up and uh, you know, YouTube is great for that. It's just kind of documenting real life. Nice. Um, now that your YouTube channel is obviously very well rooted, and I mean, you show up at like Neef and like you've got, it's like Santa Claus, you've got a line of people waiting to talk to you. Um, is there like an internal for you when you go out and do, is there like a goal that is kind of encapsulated what you want to do with it? Uh, I've, the main thing is that, uh, you know, I do want to grow the audience because the more people I reach, the more people I can inspire and help. Uh, so when that's the goal, I mean, there's sacrifices that come along with that. that. So um, I always want to talk to a lot of people. So I'll create content that I know is able to reach a lot of people, not narrow things down into, you know, our small little world of astrophotography. I try to talk about more of the broader subjects to get more people into this hobby. And, uh, you know, sometimes that's like, you know, people might look at a, a video like my most recent one, where it was like a rather simple DSLR and uh, setup with this, you know, my old rusty mount that still works great, my Skywatcher mount, mind you. And, uh, and they say, well, why would you do that? And the decision making process on there is that I know there's a lot of beginners out there in that situation where they're just like, okay, tell me what I need. I don't have a huge budget, but tell me what I need and show me what's possible with it. So I'll continue to make videos about that kind of beginner level gear because I know it's going to reach a lot of people. So, um, yeah, reaching a lot of people and getting those views and getting subscribers is a high priority for me. Uh, and the fact that, you know, the gamification of it all, I'm big on that, seeing the numbers and the watch time and stuff. So I kind of nerd out with that kind of thing too. So I think that's been a part of it as well. Very cool. Yeah, I, I've been doing outreach myself for many years, but I think now with the these YouTube channels like yourself, uh, I also kind of throw that into outreach and education. I think a lot of people think, oh, I have to go to a school or it has to be with kids, which that's kind of what I specialize in. But even you, I consider outreach because just because you're already doing it doesn't mean that the outreach and the education has to stop um, there. So I think you and other YouTubers, I kind of commend you for putting the time and effort for doing it because it all has to start out from a passionate thing and then it grows into what you have now. Yeah, that's the, the kind of selfish side of things is that when when the feeling of ins when you know you've inspired someone, there is not many feelings better than that. So I, I think I'm addicted to that and I'll continue to create content that inspires uh, in the most dramatic fashion I can. And that's a lot of the editing time goes into that. I want to keep their attention. I want it to be exciting. I want them to be very interested in what I'm doing. I don't want to throw them off with something like, you know, this downer video, even though I want to be real, but I also want to show how exciting this hobby is. And uh, yeah, I have that feel of responsibility to inspire. Uh, so that's probably the biggest driving factor behind uh, everything because yeah, I mean, there's, there's things you can do as a career on YouTube and uh, you know, or just the online world in general. And, and the path I'm taking is not by any means optimized. I mean, it's, there's much more time than, you know, I am compensated for put it that way. 
I can't even imagine all the background work. Um, so when you're obviously a lot of people do astrophotography, we already know that that's kind of a, a, it's a difficult thing. It's a challenging thing. Um, but you throw on top of that recording. Uh, what are the challenges that you find when you're doing imaging at night and trying to make a video at night? I know you got new glass for your cameras that makes that a little easier, but it's still, they kind of almost in a way contradict each other. Yeah, there, there's definitely a balance there. So uh, just because you reminded me of it, the new glass, the, the technical gear side of things is important and then and sometimes you don't realize what you need until you put yourself in these situations look back at the video footage and say like oh wow like you know what i could have captured that moment a little better so in the case of the the lens you were mentioning uh it's a wide angle really fast lens f 1.4 so i can suddenly shoot video where you can actually see stars in the night sky so it's great if i'm pointing out a constellation or you know, Pleiades and uh, Venus uh, not too long ago, you can actually see it in video. Uh, and without the right lens, you can't really capture those moments or document them properly. Um, so that's a big part of it too. And then the lighting is of course super challenging because uh, you know, pitch black plus video is not a great combination. So um, people need to see you and what you're talking about lit up. So you gotta get creative with lighting where you're trying to capture this situation at night that looks natural, but you also want people to see it and hear it properly. So yeah, there's been so much trial and error there. And as I was saying, you know, even a few years ago, um, I learned the hard way a few things where it's just like, oh, this does not look good. Uh, the realness was there, but the quality just wasn't there. Mm -hmm. um, and then, and lastly, um, there's a lot of moments where not a whole lot of exciting things are happening in astronomy. Like um, if I'm taking a picture and the camera's firing away, I can either talk about a situation, tell a story during that moment, uh, or just cut to the next thing that happens. But, you know, to leave the camera running um, while I'm literally just sitting and waiting for the exposure to finish would be like watching paint dry. So uh, <laughs> you got to kind of pick and choose the times that are exciting enough to share in the video. Yeah, I, and I think you've made a really nice balance at that because, you know, anybody who's imaged all night, it's like, all right, sequence is running. Now what? So, but I know now you're even running like multiple rigs at this point. So, um, so going from that being running multiple rigs, I know there's a bunch of people that you have a arsenal of equipment. And I know you use a lot of our stuff, which is awesome, but you use a lot of stuff um, as well. What are some of the things that, what's the equipment that you're using now? Um, and what, you know, what would you be adding in the future to, or not adding in the future, but um, obviously we're in galaxy season right now. So you're switching things up to cater to that. Mm -hmm. So um, I always find an excuse to shoot with a small refractor in a DSLR. Uh, so for anyone that saw the latest video, yes, I do actually shoot with a rig like that uh, constantly, even though it's galaxy season right now, um, there's still wide field projects that I love to do. So that's one of my favorite types of astrophotography, uh, using some really old gear and that's in that case. Uh, my favorite go-to rig right now is the, uh, the Skywatcher Spree 150 refractor. I mean, of course, you know, it's it's great that uh, it's Skywatcher, but it's not it's not the primary reason I'm using it. Uh, you guys didn't tell me I had to use it or anything. It's just a big refractor telescope. So I kind of have the best of both worlds where I get the focal length and the reach of some of these other types of telescopes, like an SCT, a smaller one. Uh, but I get that refractor experience that I love. Uh, and that's on the EQ8. And uh, so it's also, uh, you know, the monochrome camera. So building LRGB images, which wasn't something I did on a regular basis until now. And I've just kind of fallen in love with that system and constantly finding new projects to shoot with that one. And then on the horizon is the, uh, the Celestron S SCT, um, the Edge 11. So that's a whole different animal altogether. 
at uh, nearly 3,000 millimeter focal length. And it has been challenging early on uh, because it's such a different user experience that I'm used to. But of course, sharing the trials and tribulations of that rig are great content uh, because there's a lot of people in that position too. So I'm enjoying that process with the hurdles along the way. So that's kind of where I'm at gear wise. Nice. Yeah, that's, um, I know we've talked about this on the past, but yeah, it's a very different experience to go from a small refractor or even a midsize refractor. Like you're, I know you've got like a 130 and you've got the obviously R100 and the Esprit 150, but it's a completely different experience when you start getting into these long focal length optics because the game's all the rules essentially change from the way you guide to the cameras that are used to how you approach exposure um, to even the mount selection is, you know, crazy on it. So good luck. So, <laughs> <laughs> it's, it it's, makes me think of the, uh, you know, when people are giving advice uh, and they, they have that one be all end all answer for this is the best way to do this. It's like, no, there's there's multiple answers and ways to approach things because what's best for one thing isn't best for the other. Um, and yeah, now I'm in the, you know, I publicly shared the fact that my old ways of star alignment and finding targets just weren't cutting it for this new rig. So, you know, I can't just recommend that as the solution. Just use the hand control and a star alignment, good polar alignment, and you're good and you're good to go because that doesn't work in some situations. So you know, take take advice when when people say, well, this is how you do this and that's all there is to it. Take that with a grain of salt. Yeah. Um, so when someone asks you, you know, they want to get started in astrophotography, um, obviously there's a million and a half different combinations you can use. But what what are your rules of thumb or what would you recommend to someone who wants to dabble in it or maybe has a basic setup like a star adventure and then where would you say to move up to your first serious rig? Yeah, so for someone that uh, was just, a, say, a landscape photographer moving into astro, long exposure imaging at night, I would suggest a star tracker, the star adventures, great example, or the uh, Ioptron sky guider or the sky tracker. Those are great, but when you're at that point and you're looking to move up, um, and you've got either a telephoto camera lens or you want to get your first telescope, I 100% would recommend a wide field refractor because it is going to be the closest thing to a camera lens, so pretty comfortable and familiar that way. And wide field is so forgiving on your tracking accuracy, uh, auto guiding, polar alignment, all those crucial pieces that need to be spot on can be a little loose in the beginning and you can still get results. You'll, you'll take that minute and a half exposure uh, and get round stars as long as you're balanced and polar aligned and the basics are there. So getting those small doses of victories along the way with that wide field refractor, that's important for moving on because you'll always, like I'm living proof, I'm using these other rigs now, but I'm still using that and loving that wide field refractor and the images I take with that. So that's the, the telescope road I would take for sure. Awesome. Um, now, I, I know this question comes up a lot, and we've talked about it, and we get it every day, but um, I know there's a lot of people who come in, and they're getting ready to make the jump to auto-guiding. Um, and there's... Where, what are your recommendations for people on that? Because I, I talk to a lot of people, I know you, you do as well, and it seems like auto guiding is almost overthought, and there's too much worry put into what's being displayed and not enough about the image itself. Um, where would, uh, what are your thoughts on people doing that? So when I think back to when I started auto guiding in 2012, I guess it was PhD, not the original PhD, um, was had a lot less features than it does now, and I, maybe that helped. So it was a lot more of a simplified process back then, and the basics do need to be in place. You need to have your guide camera focused properly on the stars. You need to have um, you know, I still use for better or for worse the, the, old, the old school ST4 cable plugged into the guide camera and the mount. I mean, 
the the EQ8R came out last year and it has an ST4 port, so I can't be too far behind using that. Um, but so what I would do is just go through the absolute basics of guiding with PhD and, uh, you know, learning how to run the calibration um, on PhD. So it's, it's actually up and running properly. And then before you start over analyzing the graph and the RMS error and all of those things that you can tweak, I would say take, take a three minute, four minute exposure with the pretty much the default settings of your auto guiding system and check out how round those stars are in a four minute exposure. Uh, if it's a wide field setup or camera lens, they might be perfect. And you know, if you're a little farther in focal length to the 400 or 500 range and they're still round, man, you've got that thing humming along just fine. So don't start trying to improve it and overthinking things because you'll go down this rabbit hole of, of looking in the forums and people um, telling you what you need to do and what you need to look for. Um, but as we've talked about so many times before, Kevin, the, you know, there's so many variables, the, you know, your scene conditions can be different than what someone else is using with their settings. So you're not, you're never going to reach the same, uh, numbers that they're reaching in terms of tracking error. Um, yeah, I guess the overall, don't overthink it. You default settings that PhD recommends. They even, you know, have that nice, uh, set up walkthrough process when you start it now. And uh, just use the basics and, and use the pictures to decide whether uh, the auto guiding is, is going well or not. Um, and then one last question I have for you um, before we jump to our Q&A section is where do you see Astro Backyard going in the future? Because I know that's, uh, that's a big thing. I, I see it coming out of the backyard a little more. Um, so I'll always enjoy doing these backyard videos and tutorials and image processing tut tutorials and all these fun things that I can do here. That's the meat and potatoes. But um, stuff like, you know, going to visit you in the desert, seeing some more observatories in the United States. Uh, I have plans to go visit Dylan in Australia and see the southern sky for the first time. Uh, so, you know, more adventures where I get to bring the audience along and get to share the excitement that comes along with that. There's a lot of opportunities that come up uh, when there's a lot of people watching you. You know, I'm contacted constantly by by people all over the world and kind of have to pick and choose like, well, what's a good fit for my audience? What, you know, what do they expect out of Astro Backyard? So lots of tough decisions to make, but uh, more opportunities and more uh, traveling for sure. That's that's what's on the horizon for Astro Backyard. Well, that'd be cool. I, I know it'd be cool to go to some different places and events with you at some point. I know we've been to Neve, but it'd be cool to actually be out under the stars and imaging with each other. So, um, so at that point, I want to kind of open it up probably for the next 20 minutes or so, because I know we have a bundle of people here that probably have questions for you, and this is a direct route to you. Um, so we're going to start, um, with some of these questions though. The first one is once the pandemic is over, what is the first location away from home you're looking forward to imaging from? Oh, uh, you know, it's funny. I had all of these plans this year. Well, you know, I had this calendar, uh, and it all got wiped out of all these amazing things I would like to do. So there's a few hot spots that uh, are on my list that I have to do every year. One of them's the Cherry Springs State Park in Pennsylvania because it's Bortle Class 2. It's three and a half hours away. I've made some friends there. So um, doing that would be great. Um, I just found out that one of the biggest star parties or the biggest star party in Canada was canceled for August. So it's kind of hard to plan out where I'm going. Even um, I guess it would, we're looking into next year maybe now. Um, but, um, I, I definitely need to get to the desert. I need to go back to, um, you know, where I was in California. I want to get out to Arizona as well. So I think, um, in, in the United States, because it's, you know, kind of a quick flight and seeing some dark skies in, in the U S is first up. Nice. Well, definitely love to get you out here and hook you up with some of the observatories and such. Um, the next question I've got here is, having now used the EQ-8R and the EQ-6R, what are the major differences you see in guiding accuracy or other factors? 
So the funny thing about that is, and uh, you know, I hope you're okay with this answer, Kevin, but uh, it's it's like I'm using a big EQ6R. I, I'm I'm sure in the specs because it is a newer mount, there are some improvements, uh, new technology, obviously, but. The way I looked at it, the, the the six was the perfect mount for me, and I loved the uh, the whole experience. And the eight is basically a six with a bigger payload capacity, so it allowed me to use bigger scopes like the the Esprit 150. Yet it had that comfortable experience I was used to with the SynScan system. So, um, you know, the the tweaks that you guys made to the the eight, um, you know, perhaps I haven't fully utilize them but uh yeah i just like that it's like a big six <laughs> yeah that's it's they actually use the same motor board um the motors are different but the gears are bigger obviously they're eight inch 203 millimeter gears um but yeah that's where all that payload capacity comes up you just need to use the through mount ports on that thing you'll be good to go so. yeah um next question any astro backyard podcast coming up I miss the old style podcast. Mm. <laughs> so that has become, if you didn't notice the transition, that has become just the astrophotography podcast. Uh, so Steve is still doing that podcast. He, uh, he hasn't done an episode in a while. I'll come back on as a guest from time to time, but he's doing interviews with all sorts of people. He did the uh, developer for Nina. He had Scott Roberts on there. So it's just called the Astrophotography Podcast now, and you'll see me as a guest on there from time to time. Cool. Well, I have to check that one out. So uh, next question. I'm going to elaborate on this one too. Um, should I start auto-guiding if I'm a beginner? Um I'm assuming, I'm not sure what they're utilizing. Obviously, there's some factors in there, but where would you tell a beginner that it's time to switch to an auto guider? Sure. So I'm assuming the uh, you're using a mount that has an auto guider port. And yeah, so if you've got everything working properly and you find that, uh, say, you're shooting at 400 millimeters and you're, you know, you're shooting two and a half minute, three minute exposures and you're starting to get some tracking error, you'd like to shoot a little bit longer that's a good signal that it's time to try auto guiding to expand your exposure limit to four or five minutes. Uh, and if you've got everything running so well that you're getting sharp two minute exposures, there's a good chance that, you know, uh, all the, the basics that need to be there in terms of polar alignment and balance are in place for auto guiding. Then you can start to, you know, plug add a guide scope, add a guide camera and, uh, start with that ST4 cable and, uh, practice using PhD2 guiding and uh, walk through the wizard there and uh, and see how it goes. But yeah, I would say the time to, to look into auto guiding is when you've maxed out, you know you're at the limits of your mount's abilities um, without guiding. Nice. That's probably nailed it. <laughs> um, this is a good one because you just brought it up. Uh, why are you so against plate solving? <laughs> I, I don't, well, okay, first of all, there was uh, actually, so going back to Steve from the, the podcast, he actually tried to help me out with uh, plate solving through the software I was using, Astrophotography Tool, uh, probably two years ago, and I, we ended up wasting, I think, three or four rare clear nights trying to get it sorted out, and there was some problems. I'm sure I did something wrong. There was, you know, issues with my computer and drivers and that whole, the funnest side of astrophotography all these issues where I was just like, I became so bitter about it. And I'm like, I could have just star aligned and got four nights of imaging in there. So I'm kind of, uh, and I love, I hear Chuck uh, Ayub say this as well. He, I'm an, if it ain't broke, don't fix it kind right. of guy. So if, if I'm, if things are running perfectly and I'm doing exactly what I need them to do, I find very little reasons to take a time out, stop and change things up. So until most recently with this, uh, this Edge 11, which I'm sure a lot of you loved seeing me uh, crumble under pressure on that one, uh, I, haven't just, I haven't had a reason to, but I do now. Yeah, well, it's, as someone who does use it, I, it's awesome. But obviously, I know I chat with this a lot of, um, with other people, is once you get a rhythm or flow with your imaging system, it's kind of good just to stick with that that rhythm obviously you're in a unique situation because your systems are constantly changing so but um yeah once you find a rhythm it's even processing it's the same thing um 
Next question. Uh, my Star Adventure Pro has a lot of exploration left in it. My bank account does not. <laughs> on a spend on a spend of less than a thousand for all equipment, what would your recommendation for great astrophotography be? For all equipment under a thousand, my my biggest recommendation would be uh, check the classified sites because. Uh, that's not a huge budget when you consider all the pieces that come into play. But um, I, I was talking to someone about this recently, how uh, I love that the astronomy community for classified stuff, buying used equipment, uh, is such a great community in general. I mean, people are willing to, uh, first of all, people take really good care of their gear, which is nice. And they're also really happy to talk about uh, the gear and answer questions and stuff. So with a really limited budget, that's the main thing, you know, looking to used gear. I bought a lot of used stuff over the years and, uh, never had a bad experience. Um, but in terms of, so the star adventure, I mean, I don't know the, you know, buying a, a nice lens is never a bad move because then that opens the door to new projects and new focal lengths. Like, uh, recently I got that, uh, I guess it was last summer. Now the Rokinon 135 millimeter lens, that was something that I could use on a star tracker, yet it got me so as excited as I would with a new big telescope that could shoot at a thousand millimeters. So uh, lenses are something to look into if, if you don't uh, have an arsenal of them yet. They're, they can be really handy for certain projects. Cool. Um, this is one of the biggest questions that we'll get today. Will Rudy be supporting more of your videos in the future? <laughs> yes, of, of course he will. I tried to... Uh, I try to throw him in whenever possible because uh, the, the funny thing is about the decision to include him in my videos. Before I started my channel, I used to watch this um, guy that would go on these uh, RV adventures, like solo camping and stuff. Very popular niche on YouTube. And he had this cat. It was just him and his cat. And uh, Jax was the cat's name. And I remember every time the cat was in the video, I was like, yes, Jax is back. And like all the comments were about Jax. I'm like, man, if I ever do a YouTube channel, I'm putting Rudy in it because I know people will love it, love seeing him. And they do. Uh, it, it's the mascot. <laughs> exactly. Um, auto guiding question. So you recommend using the ST4 for beginners. And what would you recommend for polar alignment with a 80 millimeter refractor and an EQ 6R Pro? 80 millimeter refractor in the EQ6. So that's a very promising, reliable setup to begin with. Uh, polar alignment, man, I would look through the, the polar scope and uh, just use an app, um, depending on which you know phone you're using, but polar finder for Android. And I know there's a really great um, Apple one as well. Um, it uses the GPS location in your phone to tell you exactly where to place Polaris. Um, I think to, I'm assuming you're in the Northern hemisphere, but it will tell you where, uh, how to do it in the South as well. But, um, actually look through that illuminated polar finder scope and align it manually. It shouldn't take more than two, three minutes and you can fine tune that adjustment. You can do that without buying, investing in, um, a pole master or looking into some of the more um, software uh, assisted options that you have. I'm, I'm just thinking in the realms of keeping things simple. So use an app, polar align manually. That's how I did it for years and years and years. And it, uh, you know, it was great. Um, and then the, as for the ST4 cable thing, I think that's a bit of an easier road to take early on. There's less um, headaches from a software point of view. Uh, because when you do want to do that pulse guiding through the uh, directly from the mount, you'll have to make sure that you get ASCOM uh, on your computer and all the correct drivers and everything in the mount control. And that can lead to a whole um, long list of, of problems to, to troubleshoot. Um, so I, I find the SD4 cable to be a simple solution that, you know, I still use it after all this time and I'm happy with my guiding. So awesome. be my advice there. I've always wanted to know about that too. I never really played with the difference between ST. We use ST4 when we're testing mounts because it's there and just boop, done. Um, but yeah, it simplifies the driver question. And then if you want to get advanced on polar alignment, you can always add a pole master, which seems to be the ultimate uh, way to go. Yeah, you'll never regret that purchase if you can justify it, that's for sure. Um, next question. Now that you have a C11, is high resolution planetary imaging on your mind? I've, I've thought about it. So, uh, the, the only thing uh, I need now is a, a camera that's optimized for that. So, um, not only is, will I need the right camera for planetary imaging, but 
the imaging style will need to change and perhaps even the software that I use, something that's more suitable for planetary imaging. So even though it is astrophotography through a telescope, you know, as I've been doing, it's a totally different uh, animal altogether. And yeah, it's something I really do want to get into. The biggest Thing I'm having a hard time dealing with, with with planetary is the thought of not taking a picture of a beautiful nebula or galaxy uh, and instead focusing my attention on a planet. Uh, as bad as it sounds, it's like, oh, it's it's that's hard for me to do. Like I, I'm just so right. It's like, oh, but Andromeda is up right now. I can't shoot Mars. Like, yeah, so that's something I have to get over. And I think with multiple rigs kind of running in the background and more automated stuff in the future that will allow me to finally, you know, spend some much needed time on solar system imaging. Awesome. Yeah. I, I need to dabble with my C11 a little bit more and see how that works out. But it, like you said, it's, it's a whole nother dynamic. So it's kind of like, well, I have to rethink all this stuff now. So, um, Regarding beginner auto guiding, will you do a beginner auto guiding setup with guide scope and camera using PhD two with a DSLR? I I really should because clearly it's a, a hot topic and, and question we're getting a lot. Uh, in the fall of last year, I did do a, an overview video of the software I use, astrophotography tool, and PhD two guiding. Uh, it was like a thirty minute video. It was like. It was actually um, a huge flop in terms of view, but not a lot of people watched it. Um, but um, so I do have some existing material on it, but I think it's time to do uh, a new overview that's more in depth. Uh, and it's definitely on my list. I'll, I'll make it a priority. Cool. This is a, I'm actually curious about your answer on this one. At what point did you have to switch to an astro camera versus a DSLR? Well, I never had to, but where when I finally realized what I was missing was with the uh, the ZWO ASI 071 uh, and that and I was I fought against that that was uh, from uh, Steve who's in Ontario with me from uh, Ontario Telescope he was like oh you got to try this camera and it was I was calling it a we both called it a CCD I'm like I'm a DSLR imager I don't do CCD imaging and then uh, of course I called it a CCD camera and everyone ate me alive because it's a CMOS sensor um, but when I start when I cooled that sensor down to minus 30 uh, and I started to see the lack of noise in each exposure I was imaging and the that live loop of three seconds where I could see my DSO in the field of view I was like Oh, I understand now. Like this is just cleaner data. And the first time I processed data through a dedicated astronomy camera too, I was like, I get it now. Like, uh, you, I feel like with a DSLR, you can still get there. You just have to work for it a little harder. So I think that the user experience during the acquisition is a lot funner with a DSLR, uh, but processing an image taken with a dedicated astronomy camera that's where you where it really wins and, and you probably have a lot more fun on that side of things cool we got time for a couple more questions we can run over a little bit too if you're cool with that if there's a bundle of them but um i suppose oh. so um what is your favorite youtube astrophotography channel hmm. i it's a it's a split um so i'm a huge fan of chuck uh for several reasons. One, that uh, he's just a great guy. Uh, and two, he's basically my neighbor. He's only three, three and a half hours, four hours away from me, even though he's on the other side of the border. I really love Chuck. Dylan cracks me up. Uh, and I, when, when we did a, we did a group live stream with Dylan the other day, and we were all kind of talking about what our thing is for each of our channels. And I, I feel bad because I said Dylan was like, oh, you know, entertaining and comedy. And he is those things, but he also has some really solid information. He's a really smart guy. You know, he actually makes me very intimidated when we're in the same room talking because he does know his stuff. Uh, he's very scientific. And uh, so I, I've learned a lot from Dylan on that side of things and, you know, some of the, you know, the reasons uh, behind some of the techniques we use. And Chuck, I like because he's just an ordinary guy who's taking APOD images and uh, he's so relatable in that way those are probably my two favorite channels right yeah i i watched dylan's video the other day with his like science project one and uh i had no idea that you could plate solve and pick some sites and i have to go back and watch his video and learn how to uh, map all that out so 
I like that how he just spins things um, is kind of hysterical. There's like no hold back from him on a lot of that stuff, which it kind of breaks the ice. And Chuck is very cool because he's he's kind of like you are just very it's just a guy in his telescope. There's nothing more to it. And I it's just easy to digest, but he's getting all this amazing stuff. So I think it's really helpful for a lot of people to have that casual perspective to it. Yeah, like, you know, if you, you met Chuck in a bar and had a beer with him, you would have the best conversation and it would last three and a half hours, right? Like, it's just, yeah. we both love the same things. A um, couple more minutes. Um, let me just wrap up some of these uh, last little bits. Uh, are you auto-focusing on the Esprit 150? I am not, not yet. So uh, there is, uh, sitting in a box, an Optech focuser for the Esprit 150. Um, and if I can justify... Uh, the downtime of installing it, uh, that will be going on very soon because that would be nice now that I'm shooting through the filter wheel and uh, getting even closer to a more automated system uh, to be able to autofocus from the inside the house would be really nice. Uh, as of right now, I'm getting the old Batnoff mask out and uh, refocusing between each filter, which is not uh, sustainable <laughs> over uh, over a long time. Um for those who don't know who Chuck and Dylan are, do you have their channels um, or what so, their channels? So both of them, you would just uh, type into either Google or, or YouTube, Chuck's Astrophotography, and Dylan is just his name, Dylan O'Donnell. And it's Star Stuff, so, I think, is the name of his channel. Yeah, his, sh his show is called Star Stuff, so. Cool. Um, what targets have eluded you that you still want to capture? Oh, there's, there's a lot. Um, so now it's a lot of the smaller stuff because I have these systems that where I can actually reach them. Uh, so a lot of the smaller stuff in galaxy season right now, I'm just having a heyday. Um, I really want to do the sunflower galaxy. Um, and I also want to do the sombrero galaxy uh, again. And these are targets that I have shot just for fun with my DSLR and wide field refractor that were just like little bitty tiny galaxies. So those two stand out, but really any small galaxy right now is, uh, is, gets me really excited. I've got three questions left for you, and then we'll close this up. Uh, really appreciate you being on here today, too. So um, I'm sure everyone else does. Uh, maybe we can do it again in the future sometime. Um, or you'll just have to come see him in person at an event. Uh, uh, let's see. Uh, do light pollution filters work well for you, like the imaging ones? They they do. They always have to the extent where I remember the first time I saw the argument that that no pollution, no light pollution filter unfiltered from a light polluted area is a better choice than a light pollution filter because uh, you're actually losing detail and everything. I was like, wow, that has not been my experience. I get more usable data when I use a light pollution filter. And I know that's really hard to give advice for for which filter is best because there's you know your sky changes so much but for where i am and the the targets that i shoot which is so Bortle class six seven so an orange zone very you know very bright led lights in my neighborhood and i'm constantly shooting towards the south uh into the light dome of my city so for me being a nebula shooter i mean they really create contrast between my target and the night sky and then, yes, it is a different experience in the processing. You'll need to do stuff like, um, you know, if the stars that have a red tinge to them or the blues aren't captured properly. Properly, There's techniques you can use to restore and correct those elements. Uh, and for me, a light pollution filter does, uh, creates better data that I can actually use and process better. Sweet. Um, two more for you. First one is, uh, what's your dream telescope? So it's sitting in the backyard right now. There's free 150. Uh, honestly, so put it this way. My, my dream telescope was, uh, I mean, five years ago was the Explore Scientific 127 because it was just the biggest version of a telescope that I already owned. So to have an Esprit 150, that's, that's as, I mean, there's doesn't get any better than that. It's kind of a powerhouse of a scope. That's uh, my weapon of choice personally so tough to beat man 
Um, and the final question for you, um, what do you think is the future of astrophotography? Could be technology, outreach, etc. Oh man, it's really tough to say. We're in such a transitional time. I mean, Starlink is a hot topic right now. And people, what I do like about Starlink um, and the reactions that it's drawing up is that people are starting to pay attention and realize that the idea of okay, should a company be able to spoil the night sky for all of us, right, arguably? Um, there's a lot of astronomers that feel like, you know, this is a terrible, you know, how, how dare they ruin our night sky, right? And um, so stuff like that is a bit scary to see how far and how bad that will get. How many, you know, what will the night sky look like in 20 years in a long exposure image? Will it just be completely crowded with, with, with space junk? Um, but I mean, I'm also not naive to think that, you know, like there's, you know, there's a lot of good that comes from Starlink too. I mean, we're on a live stream right now, so, uh, you can't just take things for granted, uh, for modern technologies and then complain about them because it affects you personally in one area. Um, but astrophotography, I honestly think over the next 10 years is going to quadruple in, um, in terms of the audience that's into it and, what once was a small little world of this niche hobby, I think is going to become a lot more mainstream. And uh, I really believe that. So that should be exciting. Awesome. Well, thanks a lot for uh, being on here, Trevor. Um, hopefully we can definitely do it again.